Today we're going to be talking about the backwards confidence interval. We finally discussed enough basic material in order for us to actually construct our first confidence interval. This won't be the final one we'll learn about. Actually, in depth, we're going to be learning about one more of these, and I'll be explaining a couple of confidence intervals that are more sophisticated than this later on. But we actually have enough to go ahead and do this. So let's get started. So let's do a little review first. We've got a population. We are interested in some parameter of this population, which we'll call theta. Uh, this might be the average IQ. We'll go ahead and we'll take a random sample of some sample size. Uh, we can call this sample from this population. And we'll go ahead and we'll generate something like theta hat from this population. So this will be the average IQ of our, of our sample. And we've already discussed that theta hat tends to be, you know, given no other information and according to the plug-in principle, tends to be a pretty good estimate for theta. Now, what we discussed previously was that theta hat does tend to be the best estimate for theta, but we don't know how good of an estimate theta hat is. And so we introduced the confidence interval, which will give us some probabilistic, some chance-based interpretation of how good theta hat is at estimating theta. So instead of just studying theta hat and the sampling distribution as we've done before, I want to make a small difference. And this small difference will be, we will be studying the difference distribution, which will be theta hat minus theta. Okay. Again, the only thing that we've done is we've taken the sampling distribution and from every single sample that we get from our sampling distribution, we'll subtract the general mean of the population. So pretty simple. Again, it will look something like uh, an average distribution. And this will again be the difference distribution, theta hat minus theta. Now let's say we're interested in some part of this distribution. Let's say we're interested in some point x on this distribution, such that the area under this part of the curve is less than or just basically equals 0 0.25 or Actually, let's, let's go ahead and make this even smaller. Let's go ahead and make this 0 0.025, 0 0.025. So pretty small, pretty small area over here. Now what we discussed is that this actually has a probabilistic, a chance-based interpretation. What this basically means is that the chance that we get a sample from our difference distribution that's above X is equal to 0 0.025 or 2.5%. So let's write this out. The probability that we get a sample from our, diff uh, our difference distribution, which is theta hat minus theta, that is greater than x, is equal to 0 0.025, uh, which equals 2.5%. Uh, so a pretty small likelihood. Now, you might already sort of see the trick that I'm going to do here, but we're going to do one algebraic step. We're going to go ahead and we're going to move theta over onto the right-hand side of the inequality, and we're going to move x onto the left-hand side. So again, for those that are familiar with algebra, this should be pretty simple. Um, so in this case, we're going to get theta hat minus x is greater than theta equals again 2.5%. So what have we done? The magic is we can now read this in an entirely different way. The chance that theta will be less than theta hat minus x is 2.5%. We have come up with a lower bound for theta. That's pretty cool. So we just take x, we subtract from it whatever our sampling, uh, whatever our sampling uh, draw was, so whatever our theta hat was. So we took a sample, we took the average IQ of the sample. So we take the average IQ of the sample, we minus X, and we say that, hey, the chance that the true population's IQ is less than theta hat minus X is 2.5%. So we've created a lower bound. That's pretty magical. Um, and it's all because we were using this difference distribution. We can, of course, do the exact same thing for, uh, to find an upper bound. By instead of looking at x, we can go and look at something, you know, I'll just go ahead and call it y on this side as well and, and look at for an area on this side that's also equal to 0 0.025. Now, there are two problems with this, though. Problem number one, we need the sampling distribution. Um, 
And to get the sampling distribution, this means we need to take lots and lots of samples from the population. And we just, I mean, the, the initial point of this entire thing was to show that taking lots and lots of samples from the population, sampling everyone from the population, is really hard. It's very time consuming. So, so that's not a good thing. The second thing is that to create our sampling distribution, our difference distribution here, we needed one more thing. We actually needed to know what the true population average IQ was, what the true population parameter was. We needed to know what theta was so we could subtract it from every single value from our sampling distribution. So if we already knew what the true average IQ was, we don't need to construct an, uh, a confidence interval for the average IQ. So we'll discuss both of these assumptions and how to combat them in a couple of lectures after this. But what I want to go ahead and get you guys familiar with is taking confidence intervals by hand if you went ahead and actually had the sampling distribution. So next time, I'll be showing you the forwards confidence interval, the percentile confidence interval, which is much more common. Uh, so tune in.